uh, Church Reset book. And again, just to review very quickly, the idea that Jack Wilson presents here is that what we currently experience as the Church of Christ is a continuation of the first century church. And we all would agree that. And yet he asks the subjective question, shouldn't it be more? Based on the text that we've looked at in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, the answer is yes. There was a lot of things going on in that time period when the church was in its inception. People were meeting day by day, breaking bread and fellowship their homes. Sharing and the doctrine of the apostles. Thousands were being added. And we could go on. We spent a lot of time in that. But the point was, that's currently not what we see. Now, that's not entirely. Uh, that doesn't entirely rest on our shoulders. And he doesn't, he doesn't want to give that impression. Not only. But the truth is, is that somewhere along the way from when the church was established and created to 2022, the church had kind of veered into more of an American model than what the original model was. The original model was established upon a family model, a family concept. Oh, it's probably dead. So it was established on a family model. We looked at all the different occasions where Jesus referred to his disciples as children, brothers, sisters. Even on the occasion where he was asked, who are my mother and who are my brothers? Jesus makes it clear that he wanted a family. In Matthew 16, 18, when he said, I will build my church, what he intended was that he would build a new people, a family. He wasn't going to restore anything. He wasn't going to remodel or renovate anything, the, the temple was not coming back. Not in the way that it was, but in the way that it is now. We are the temple. Peter says that we are the living stones of the church. But at some point in our history, in the American church, we've developed more of a business model, more so than a family model. And that's not entirely true in everywhere and every place. But by and large, the American mindset of producers and consumers has come into play. And you see that in the way that churches market themselves. They'll get a big name preacher. Come see so and so. Making it preacher centric and not Christ centric. You know, and we talked about in, in, in a couple chapters before about the difference between bringing them in and going and making disciples, two very different things. Bringing in large crowds by the droves doesn't necessarily convert people to Christ. It simply gets them in your building. And the reason that's a bad form of marketing, if we're using that word, is because what you're doing is you're, you're trying to get them here and then hope that they like it. You want to get them here by the, by, by the dozen and, and hope that they like what you offer. There again, we're producing and they are consuming. And as I've said multiple times, and Jack even says in his book, Jesus never wanted customers. He wanted a family. <coughs> so that being said, we've talked about the reset and what that means. <clears throat> getting back to that original model. Getting back to the first century church. Oftentimes, when we talk about the first century church, really what we have in mind and a lot of times is we want to be the church of the 50s, not the church of the first century. And where we have to be careful, we have to be careful is that's not what Jesus intended. He said, I will build my church, not the one that we have in mind, not the one that we think was better at a better time in history, but the one that he said. And so the author takes us through this process, reminding us what our mission is. Our mission is to make disciples. Our mission is to make disciples. And if that's true, if the model is to make disciples, there will be a way in which we do that. In Matthew chapter 28, we looked at this Wednesday night. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so we understand then that Jesus had a specific mission. This is how his church would be created. When he said, I will build my church, this is that. This is the beginning of that. This was the command of how this would be done. Here are the instructions. I want you to go. We talked Wednesday night about the various ways of going, that there's no limits on the ways that we can go. We can go by foot. We can go by car, train, plane, boat, whatever. And now, in 2022, we can even go via the Internet. We have ways to reach, literally, the whole world. And so we understand that going is a general command of authority. But when he said make disciples, that's specific. Because you just don't make disciples to any old thing. You make disciples by first baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them all that Jesus commanded. This also gets tricky because we like to teach people what we like Jesus commanded. You ever notice, I mean, every preacher has a hobby horse. And I would suggest that many Christians have hobby horses too. We focus on one specific or two specific or maybe even three specific doctrines and ignore the rest of the text. Paul said, I will preach to you nothing but Christ crucified. Not meaning that he was leaving out all of the doctrines that, 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 are, that are listed elsewhere, but this very principle here. I will teach you all that I've commanded you. Not just teach you, but I will teach you to observe. I will teach you to obey and follow. And so we got into chapter 10 Wednesday night, defining the word teach. What does it mean to teach? Is it simply standing before you and orating? What else is it? What else is there to teach you? Increasing knowledge. Increasing knowledge, all right. Imaging. Imaging. Ooh, I like that one. What else? Instructing. Instructing. Example. Huh? Example. Example. All right, so we're getting into, there, there are multiple ways that we can be teaching this. It's not just simply in the things that we say, or the, the, the same things that we say, but as you just described and you described, the things that we do. People are watching. If we want to increase knowledge, I love 2 Peter chapter 2. When Peter, who is then an old man, looking back on remembering these things, he emphasizes knowledge. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in the first 15 verses, he uses the word knowledge five times. Emphasizing that knowledge, the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the foundational principle of of everything else that we do, that everything else that we do springs forward from that foundational knowledge. It doesn't encompass all knowledge, but it begins with a foundational knowledge that we then build upon, that we supplement, he says. And by supplementing it, we, we, we come across the other Christian graces that he mentions, virtue and self-control and, and so on. But knowledge is mentioned five times. It's not because God will love us more, because we know more, but that we will love him more, because we'll know him more. Yes, ma'am. got to, in the discipling process, get them to higher levels. That's right. Where, where they can analyze, you know, and make good decisions because Paul himself talked about discretion mm -hmm. and taking them from the milk to the meat and potatoes, so to speak. That's right. I love it, Hebrews. You know, when he says, some of you ought to be teachers by now, but someone needs to go back and teach you. You know, that the, they, the, they had just gotten stationary. And by and large, that's what happens in a producer-consumer model where the burden of all instruction comes upon one man when you've got a preacher-centric congregation where the preacher is doing all the teaching and people are just taking it in. Do you know how much more I learn when I have to teach class? It's, I mean, it, it, it will blow your mind. Just, just teach a class one time. Teach somebody one time and see how much more you learn yourself as the teacher. It's the great. It's, it's, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. And I think that was the idea. And even Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 or chapter 1, 
As long as I'm in this body, I intend to remind you of these things always. He said, though you already know these things, I'm going to remind you anyway. I'm going to say these things again. Sometimes people think preachers sound like broken records. That's intentional. We want to remind you again. We want to stir you up because I'll be honest with you. I can't tell you how many times I've read that text. And every now and then, some new perspective or new idea, something that I hadn't noticed before in those same words, makes itself known. And it's not because the words change, it's because I have. My understanding has deepened. I've gained knowledge. What else? What else teaches? So we've got, we've got instruction and orating. We've got example. What else? Is there any other way that we can teach? Interacting. Yes, ma'am. Interacting. Interacting, okay, so now it, it's conversational. You have to have give and take. Absolutely. You've heard me say it a hundred times. <clears throat> Preaching is good. But evangelism is not preaching alone. And evangelism without hospitality will never work. Because the dinner table is where the magic happens. See, when I'm preaching, I'm the only one talking. But when you and I sit at a table across one another, now we've, we've got a back and forth. Everybody has a voice at the table. How many times people in the New Testament are the gospel? Did you see Jesus at the dinner table? Yeah. What an example, right? Exactly. Because, because there's, a, there's a give and take. Absolutely. There's a back and forth. There's a rapport. There's a conversation to be had. And I think that sometimes... We miss that aspect of how important that is, to be able to sit down with someone. When I obeyed the gospel in 2001, it wasn't because the sermon that I heard blew my socks off. It was because the man that I was studying with sat across the table from me, and every question that I had, he would turn the Bible and push it across the table and tell me to read it so that I said it out loud with my own mouth. Ms. Sylvia? That happened. Did it really? No. Oh, yeah. I know. But isn't that amazing? It was. The dining room table is where the magic happens. It's hard to people until they've spoken it. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Recognizing distractions because in that newness of being a child of God, there's the blessings, the joys, the gratitude. Mm -hmm. But... In this whirlwind culture that we live in, that prince of darkness that surrounds us, there's a distraction. So I think even early is, is to teach what those distractions can be. Yes. Will be. Absolutely. Absolutely. How did Jesus teach you? He wanted them around them. That's right. We see the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's the greatest sermon ever recorded. Just a side note, I, I think that if we preach the Sermon on the Mount more, we'd have less problems. It's all there. However, what we see most often with Jesus was a relational teaching. It wasn't just standing in front of big crowds and preaching. There was a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. There was a relational aspect with Jesus and his teaching. And so it's, it's, it's not an event. It's a lifestyle. The truth is, is that when, when Peter says, be ready always to make a defense for the hope that is within you, what does he mean by that? That I'm always ready, I've got my Bible like right here in my holster, I'm ready to... No, it's, it's, a, it's the way that I live. I'm ready always to have this conversation. I'm wanting to have these conversations all the time. And when Paul said, I became all things that I, to all people that I might save some, the idea is that I'm going to look for a way to relate to you specifically so we can talk this conversation. It's a lifestyle. It's not, it's not an event. And a lot of times in the American church, that's what we've made it. Evangelism is an event, and it's not. Yes, ma'am. And it's taking that would-be child of God 
where they are. Yes. Not so much the telling, but Jesus was the epitome of the example of the good questioner, even to the scribes and Pharisees. Oh, yeah. How many times, right? Have you not read? Do you not know? I mean, those rhetorical questions that, you know, and we understand that Jesus never asks a question because he doesn't know. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor, right? He's, he's asking questions that he already knows the answers to. He wants you to know the answer. Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Yeah. Like he couldn't see them. Like he didn't know. He just wanted them to see where they were. That's exactly right. And so when Jesus asks questions, it, it, is, it is absolute to help us see where we are. That's what we see with, with Cleopas and his unnamed buddy on the road to Emmaus, right? It was in Jesus telling them all the things about himself from the law and the prophets that their eyes were opened, right? Before then, Jesus asked questions. And then for seven verses, he says nothing. He lets them talk. And he listens. And then he says, oh, foolish ones, have you not read? And then using the scriptures, he told them everything. What a fantastic example that is for us. Murray, you had your hand up? It's kind of going back to what Mr. Ress was saying. Um, I think that everybody takes a role in teaching. Because, you know, if you narrow that down to just the evangelists, you're getting that message three times a week. But anytime you're in a learning environment that thrives, you know, it's incumbent upon the people that are learning to have a conversation with each other. Yes. And to relate these things to each other, to talk those things out, to flesh them out for themselves. You know, um, an ongoing conversation and collaboration is, is necessary to foster growth in a learning environment. So I, I love the word that, foster. Yeah, I, I think that. So I think that responsibility falls on everybody. You know. Oh, certainly. The, the what we just read in the Great Commission, when he says, "Go into all the world," it doesn't say preacher go. Right? That's a general command for everybody. Everybody go. and make, Everybody go make disciples. Just think about that for a second. In a, in, a, in, a, in a church setting where the congregation is dependent upon one man to evangelize, every dog has his day, and good dogs have two, and you might convert one here and convert one there. But what if a hundred people are all doing it? In the first century, when the church was multiplying and growing, there, it wasn't one man. Right? You had the, the, the disciples, when the Spirit came upon them, you had 11 men, or 12, depending on where, where you view Matthias at. But the point was, is that 12, by the end of the day, Converted 3,000 men. Had the women in there, it's probably more like 4,500 to 5,000. Each one teach one. Everyone go and make disciples. Everyone. See, the thing is, is we all know somebody who needs the gospel, don't we? Everybody in this room knows somebody who's not a Christian. Each, if, just think if each one of us taught one person. What would that do? We're not bringing them in by the droves. We're making disciples one at a time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let's see how to say this. We need to, we also teach by the way we live. Absolutely. Um, good or bad, but I have an example where a team is all ages. There were three teenage boys that were Christians. And another guy at the school that had with, you know, noticed those guys. And he finally got to the point and said, I, I will, can I go to church with y'all? Where do y'all go? I, I want what you have. Mm -hmm. And they're all four faithful Christians now, but the way they, however they acted or presented themselves at school, yes. he was 
looking. The fourth guy was looking for something he may not have even realized he was looking. I, I, I've, I've seen that very thing happen. Uh, he's not here, so I'm not going to mention the his name. Side of is like when someone's surprised to find out you're a Christian. Oh yeah, they should never be surprised. And that's, that happens. That's right. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> my nephews taught someone simply by the way that they lived. And by association, he eventually learned and knew that that's what he wanted. And so he asked, right? And so sometimes opportunities present themselves to you. When I started working at uh, camp, the FC Alabama camp, I think it was probably my second year there. One of my campers comes in and his mom comes in behind him. And, you know, I, I look at him and I look at his mom and I'm like, the last name's not the same, but I knew his mom. I was like, now I said her name. She goes, yeah. She goes, Keith. I was like, yeah. She goes, what are you doing here? I was like, counselor here. Now, she didn't, she was confused because she knew me in high school when I was not behaving. I was not anywhere close to being a Christian. I didn't become a Christian until 10 years later when I was 28. But the point was is that she knew me then. So she was shocked to see me. But I was just as shocked to see her because she had grown up in the church. But she also came to all my parties. So when she was like, what are you doing here? I was like, what are you doing here? Well, I grew up in the church. I was like, I didn't know that. And so you're absolutely right. Our lives that some people will only ever read. A lot of folks did that. Growing up that way, I don't know for me. I was baptized at 15. I just got my head through. That's where it managed to. You went swimming? Went swimming. That's where it managed to. I knew what it was for. Why not to be baptized? Yes. He didn't take the. Years later, you're preaching and writing chapters for talking about prayer and those kind of things. I baptized a young woman at camp. She's one of our camp nurses. She grew up going to Athens Bible School in Athens, Alabama, the promised land, right? She went to Florida College. And then when she graduated from Florida College, she went to Auburn, which is like, you know, FC2 for a lot of folks. But the point was, is she was baptized at camp when she was 14. Because she knew what the scripture said. She'd been told if she doesn't, she's going to go to hell. And all her friends were doing it. Nothing changed. Simply knowing about it doesn't matter. When she was 25 years old, all of a sudden, sitting in a devotion one night, the light comes on. And she runs out, bawling her eyes out. And she sends me a text right after, can you come out here and talk to me? And I'm thinking she just got word that someone has passed on. Someone has died and, and she's, you know, in the throes of grief here. And I get out there and I can barely get a word out of her. She's just, <laughs> and, and, and can barely talk. And she says, I'm not safe. I said, what are you talking about? You're at camp. This is the safest place in the world. She goes, no, 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 I'm not safe. She goes, I, when I was baptized when I was 14, I'm not, I wasn't saved. I was like, how do you know? She goes, because I didn't change. I didn't do anything differently. I just did what I knew I was supposed to do. But there was, there was nothing here that happened. That whole cut to the heart thing just happened. And she goes, I need to be rebaptized. I was like, no, you don't. You need to be baptized for the first time. I would say some of that falls on the people around. Absolutely. There, there again, the, the teaching that we get by living. Yeah, in other words, uh, when you're baptized, you're going to drop them and run off and baptize you as somebody else. That's right. You don't leave them to drown. It doesn't hurt to baptize somebody else. But if you baptize five people, you better be teaching five people. Well, that's it. If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to take them to the water, teach them to swim. Right? Yes. Don't leave them there to drown. And so that's how Jesus taught. Yes, ma'am. Sure that I am right. Now she could very well 
You know how common that is? And so, I think about it like this. Jesus didn't just provide food. He fed. Right? He fed people. It's one thing to set out a buffet table and just say, everybody go. It's entirely different to sit down with someone and feed them. Here is your plate. This is what I've made for you. This, and, and you. And you feed that person. After Jesus has resurrected, remember John and Peter had, had been to the tomb, right? When the women came back saying, he, he's, he's not there, they run back there. They peek in, and what I love about that passage, Peter, it said that Peter marveled. Some translations say they marveled, implying both John and Peter. They said they, they saw his things folded, and they marveled. Why do you think that was? I've been married to Kelly for 25 years. You better believe I know how she folds her titles. Because if I ever try to help, I get in trouble. Because I don't do it the right way. That's all Jesus' things folded. They had spent three years with him. They knew how he folded his stuff. And so they tear off out of there. But then in John chapter 21, Jesus has been resurrected. But when was the last time Peter saw Jesus? When the rooster crowed, they lock eyes. They have a moment where Peter sees himself for who he really is. In that moment, that's a coward. Peter went out and wept bitterly. You've got to wonder where Peter's head's at in all this at the moment. You've got to wonder if he's wondering, man, am I even on the team anymore? Because, you know, he said I was going to do this, and I said, no, I won't, and I did. Now they're saying he's back, and what am, I, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Well, Peter does what a lot of folks do. When we wonder about our status with Jesus, he goes back to what he used to do. That's what people most often do. They go back to what they used to do. And so he goes, I'm going fishing. And of course, the rest of the disciples go with him because Peter's the oldest, most likely. So they all go back to fishing. They're out there all night. They're catching nothing. And then a very familiar scene, right? Just as David's breaking, Jesus stood on the shore in verse 4. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Have they been asked that before? Yeah, that's exactly how he came to them the first time, right? Have you got any fish? Oh, man, we've been out here all night. Well, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. You can imagine they're, they're, they're trying to pull in all these fish. They've been out there all night. Hadn't caught nothing. Jesus shows up and says, throw it over there. And now they can't pull in the nets. John's like, that's him. Did you notice, though, that G how Jesus referred to him? Children. Called them children. That's familial. That's family, right? <clears throat> so Peter's overcome, throws himself in the water. I think that's neat, too, that Jesus 
that Peter comes to Jesus through water. That's a, that's a neat example. Gets to the shore. Jesus already has fish. Jesus wasn't saying, hey, catch some fish because I need them. He's like, I know that you need this, right? You need to catch some fish for your brain. So he gets over there. Jesus is already cooking. He's got fish and he's already cooking breakfast. And then he says, bring some of the fish that you caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard, full of fish. Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And so Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, and now it was the third time Jesus revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And so we, we know the story here. But what's Jesus doing? He's feeding Peter. Remember, Peter's state of mind before this, probably full of a lot of doubt, question. The last time he locked eyes with the Lord, it wasn't good. He knew he failed. He knew he was, he was, he was not in, 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 a, in a good place. And so Jesus not only provides for Peter's mental well-being about, hey, listen, you need to catch some fish so you can get past this, but I'm going to feed you. And so when Jesus asks him these three times, do you love me? He's telling him, every time he answers him, feed my sheep. And what he goes on to tell him is that, listen, I'm leaving. And my people are going to need you to feed them the way that I just fed you. And so is the same with us when we teach people Jesus. The idea is to feed them, to teach them to swim. We're not just taking them to the water to get them wet, right? You got to teach them to swim. You got to feed them. Remember that the, the, the other part of the equation was not just baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's also teach them all that I've commanded you. There's a mutual thing happening there where it's not just about doing things, it's about learning things. It's about changing the way that you live. Again, this is not an event, it's a lifestyle. It is the way that we live. It's not just about doing something once. I got saved one time. That's not, that's not the way it works. Yes, ma'am. When we look at the word teach and think about your critical question to us, the disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father. Mm. So when we go back to Matthew 28, he was the express image of the Father. He said, you sing me, you sing the Father. Yes. That's why imaging is so important. He's not in the likeness. He's in the express image That's right. of the Father. That's right. So back to the great example that the lady gave us about the the teenagers. That's right. They, they were that image of what that fourth young man wanted. He wanted to have what they had. That's right. Jesus said you were salt and light. Salt flavors, salt preserves, light illuminates, right? That our lives are supposed to teach. It's not just about what we say, it's about what we do. I heard a sermon talking about life, being told the baptism is important stuff that he points about. I knew, and I knew that we almost had an accident that night. My two friends with me and he baptized that night. Yeah. So I was baptized that night, and for about two weeks I didn't say the cuss word. And after that, my life was pretty much the same as it being before. Yeah. I remember that when I was about 24 years old, right before I married young, I started going back to church. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so Jesus didn't mass produce disciples. Think about it. When he made his disciples, the first disciples, it was by hand. It was personal involvement, right? It's impossible to know what someone really needs and give it to them if you don't know that person. 
I think sometimes we approach the gospel as a one size fits all. And in its completeness, that's absolutely true. Every person needs it. But not every person has the same size foot. You can't, just, you, you can't just cram it on there. You have to get to know that person. It's going to be a lot easier for both parties involved if I know you a little more than just start quoting scriptures to you that you don't have any understanding of. Right? And so to, to know someone, it's, it's, much, it's more efficient to give it to them if I know what it is that they need. Paul said, again, I became all things to all people that I might save some. The idea was that if I know you and I know what your needs are, I know what your situation is, then I can teach you the same thing that I would teach this person over here, but I'll teach it in a way that you'll get it. And the thing is, y'all, we do that every day. We do it with our everyday interactions. <clears throat> Whenever you have, you interact with this person over here at this place, you sort of lend yourself to their mannerisms and their, their characteristics in some ways. Whenever you talk to these people over here, you, you lend yourself to that, that situation. That's, that's, how, that's how people sell things, right? When a salesman approaches you and starts asking questions, what does he want? He doesn't want to know just what you want. He wants to get to know you better because he can then sell you better the product that you want. As opposed to just regurgitating information. And the important thing too is that Jesus didn't keep them once he made them. He sent them. The point of evangelism and disciple making is not to amass numbers, but it's to build up the kingdom. And specifically laborers in the kingdom. Jesus sent the twelve out to preach the good news of the kingdom, to heal the sick and to cast out demons in Matthew 5. And in Luke 10 it tells us he sent out 72 and then he finished that with the Great Commission. Success is the steady development of the people in our family to the maturity that leads to full participation of the work. Full participation, that everyone here is engaged, everyone here is involved. And so how do you get started? How do you get started? Teach. Well, first you have to be sure you, you need to have some knowledge. You need to have some knowledge. So you, uh, but you don't have to have a lot. No. You just have to know somebody else that can hit. That's right. You know, we, we made the point. Keep studying. That's right. Yeah, keep studying, keep learning. But it's okay to say, I don't know. I think one of the reasons why Christians at large don't evangelize on, on, on a, on a on a mass scale like this is because it's, it's terrifying. What if I don't know the answer? Then say, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. Let's get together next week and we'll talk about that. Create another opportunity. But the idea that, 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 it's, that we were, we're petrified of not having all the answers, well, you never will. And I love the story of the Philippian jailer. Because in this moment, his whole world has come crashing down, literally. And he's ready to end it. He's ready to kill himself. Paul says, whoa, 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 don't do that. And in the same hour, he's being baptized for the remission of his sins. He's being saved. At this moment, he's ready to kill himself. In this moment, he's submitting his life to God. How much knowledge do you think he gained in that hour? You don't have to know everything. We don't have to have all the answers. You just got to start. That's how you start. I started. That's how you do it. One step. And the reaping and sowing, even physically, there are tools that God gives sun and the rain. That's right. And, and even in the teaching process, he's also given us the tools. That's right. His word, 
your admonition the last two weeks on the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Being the gift of God to all that have already. That's right. It, we, we can't leave that out of the equation, right? The, the Holy Spirit is an active participant in this with us. Isn't that what Peter told him? That the Spirit will be for you and your children and all who are called? Well, that's us. The Spirit is still part of the equation. The Spirit is still involved in the work that we're doing. Right? And, and, and again, Jesus taught from the Scriptures. I mean, Jesus could just say this, and say, that's what I, and, and because I said, but what he did was he used something that they could reference. He used something that was written down. He could have said anything and it would have held up the same authority as anything else. But the point, whenever he taught people, like Cleopas, taught him from the scriptures, taught him from the law and the prophets. We don't have to come up with the words. We, we have them. We just got to know where to go. We just got to know how to get there. And of course that happens when we dedicate time to studying and reading the Bible. Everybody here has got 15 minutes. You can read the book of Ephesians in 10 minutes. Really, five minutes if you're fast, but it's quick. It's six, it's six short little chapters. You can read Philemon in two minutes. But how jam-packed is that thing? Full of great principles. If we just, 15 minutes. If you, if you got more time, give it, give it half an hour. Give it more time. The point is, is that we all have time to know that better, to give us the confidence for the reaping and the sowing. But it won't happen if we don't first start scattering seed. It, that's where it begins. It begins by starting. And so what do you need to learn to start teaching Jesus? Do you have to know all 66 books cover to cover, all the Old Testament history, the order of the kings, the good kings, the bad kings? Do you need to know all that to get started teaching Jesus? It's good to know all that stuff. It enriches your, your base. What do you need to know? Well, you might say you just need to know what you don't know. And, uh, because there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know, I don't know. I can't answer that. And say, I tell you what, I can find somebody that does. Would you be willing to meet with me next week? I'm sorry I, I get better. And, and then if you've been a Christian for years, maybe you better work on some stuff. That's right. If you're new, then you can learn. That's right. But you bring somebody with you. That's right. You just have to put them out, hopefully, not forever. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you keep the interest up, though. I don't have the answer, but I know somebody that does, that can help us. I think that's, that's a great way. What else, Nancy? You have to know where they are. are they to know where they, they are. The so it's not even about knowing, right. but to see where they are. Whenever, whenever Phillips talked to the Ethiopian, Ethiopian unit, where was he at? He was, in, he was in Isaiah. Is Jesus in Isaiah? All over it. I, I refer often to Isaiah as the gospel of Isaiah. It's... Well, when you listen to his questions. Yes. You know, because the eunuch had a question. And Paul, like Nancy said, went there. Mm -hmm. you, you look for that commonality that could possibly be there and latch on to it. That's right. That's right. You start where they are. That's what Jesus did. He took people where they were. That's right. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. When he would go and sit with the prostitutes, was he there to tell them, good job, keep it up? He was there to call them to repentance. I get so irritated when people are like, well, Jesus hung out with sinners. I'm like, no, he didn't. He went there to teach them. His message wasn't good job, keep it up. His message was repent. But you got to go where they are. You got to meet them where they are. The woman with the 12 year issue of blood. You ever think about where her head was? For 12 years, she's had this problem that, according to the law, 
makes her ceremonially unclean. She can't touch people. Shouldn't be out in public. She's broke. Right? Said that she spent all she had on doctors and they couldn't fix it. She's absolutely alone and lonely. Can you imagine how desperate this woman was in her head? And yet, she pushes her way through the crowd to get to Jesus. And he met her where she was. Y'all, we're out of time. And this one last comment. Well, I'm thinking of that, that example you just given us. Even she was sensitive to the laws to touch the hem of his garment. That's right. You, you know what I'm saying, so She was within the law, even in this anguish. Yes, absolutely. And Jesus met her. Well, he didn't just meet her need. Right? He met her where she was and he exceeded her need. Thank y'all. These are some good scriptures to write down on some of the things we've just been talking about. I'd like to say great class, terrible hair. Hey, come on now. I could say the same about you.
We're glad that everyone could make it out this morning. We want to welcome you, and we especially want to welcome all the visitors that we have this morning. There's a, a good number of visitors. That's great to see, and it's uh, definitely a beautiful Lord's Day. We're happy to have you, and we want to welcome you back um, anytime that you're in the area. We'll meet again this afternoon at 4 o'clock for another worship, and then uh, every Wednesday evening at 7 for Bible study. Uh, if you'd like to follow along in just a, uh, a moment, uh, Jackson Fielding will be reading uh, our scripture reading for us from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. He'll read verses 4 through 8. Uh, leading our singing this morning is going to be Murray Hyman, and at the time that he uh, has designated, uh, Russ Wilshire will have our opening prayer. Uh, speaking to us about the collection will be Ronnie McCarty. Preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper, uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, will be uh, Frank Dungan. Preaching for us this morning is Keith Stonehart, and uh, leading us in our closing prayer will be uh, David Lauderdale. Uh, if you have any announcements that, uh, that Aiden doesn't already have, try to get those to him between now and then, um, but he'll be, uh, um, following the closing prayer, he'll be bringing us a few announcements uh, to close. Again, we want to welcome everyone here. We're so glad that you could make it, especially our visitors. We're, we're honored to have you uh, with us this morning. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us another Lord's Day that we can come and worship with one another, fellowship with our brothers and sisters, sing songs of praises to you, Pray to you together, listen to a message from your word, and especially to remember the sacrifice of your son. We, we ask that you be with, uh, with Christians that are doing the same thing today around the world. There are many brothers that, uh, that we have fellowship with who are preaching to to Christians in areas that, uh, that are not as friendly as, uh, as neighborhoods around, around us are. And they're persecuted, and we ask that you continue to give them courage, continue to let the gospel spread in areas around the world, and help us to, to reach out to those in our neighborhood as well that we might always be spreading your gospel. Be with us throughout this worship. Help us to, to give glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll now have our scripture reading. Again this morning, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Good morning. All of our songs this morning will come out of hymns for worship if you need to follow along. Our first song will be number 190. 190. We'll sing all three verses. <clears throat> no. Come be
63. After this song, we'll have our opening prayer, followed by the contribution. Number 63, we'll sing all four verses after this while our opening prayer, followed by the uh, <coughs> pray this morning, you probably are all aware of the situation in the world, particularly in the nation of Mozambique where we support a number of preachers. There is creeping food shortage due to the war in Ukraine and Russia. And in the interest, we've been concentrating on offering our prayers to the Lord 
by name, calling out individuals. Let me read you the list of individuals that we support from this congregation so that when we pray, these will be on your mind. It's a lengthy list. Paulo de Mayo, Bernardo Armando, Pedro Alberto, Justin Najeri, Santos Chaibo, Tandarai Mabara, Mario Jarosi, Julius Hirosi, Bocas Namatambo, Augusto Antonio, Manuel Naziza, Castro Paulo, Albino Aquarini, Tomas Jorge, Vasco Xavier, Vincente Felipe, Alicia Florindo, Jose Josine, Joao Albino, Abel Pauline, Jose Fraga, Citron Mashava, Mateus Marosa, Jorge Jacino, Gibson Klein, Mariano de Mayo, Filippo Masueri, Joaquim Joaquim, Andrea Fasone, Inacio Renko, Salomeo Mongogo, Samuel Zacharias, Zacharias Moses, Joao Gabriel, Antonio Manisa, Sergio Artur, and Gaspar Ulaka. I've read to you 37 names. 36 of those are supported entirely by this church. They have converted thousands over the years that we've supported them. We've supported them about seven years at this point when we began our work in Mozambique. These men are critical to the future of the church in Mozambique. They're under spiritual attack too, not just because of food prices and gasoline prices and getting around the forces of institutionalism, the forces of denominationalism continually are attacking. I would just wanted to mention these before our prayer so that it can impress upon you as you offer your thoughts to God that it's so important that we continue our work here and support their work there. It's a way we can go and teach even when we can't go. Pray with me. Our gracious Father, we are so thankful. We're awed by your majesty. We're uplifted by your presence with us this morning. We pray, Father, for all of these that we have mentioned by name this morning, that you would hold up their hands in the gospel, give them strength and boldness to proclaim your word, and help them to be the kind of ministers of your gospel that you would have them to be by their example, by their sound teaching, and by their manner of life. Father, we pray not only for these men, for all your servants throughout the world who are preaching and teaching in various places, some of them very difficult. We pray that your hand of mercy and comfort and strength will be with them, guiding them into all truth. And Father, we pray that as we as a congregation support them, that we be concerned about our own 
health as well. Be with our elders. Be with our deacons. Be with all our members, especially those who have needs at this time. Some are sick. We have shut-ins. We pray for them. We have those that are in distress, having lost loved ones. Others are in difficulty due to job losses and other things that divert our attention away and cause us great pain. We pray for your help, your consolation, your strength, your guidance in all these things. Father, we especially pray for our efforts to teach the lost in this place, that you would help us to recognize opportunities when they become available to us and help us to latch on to those and do what we can to further your kingdom. We pray, Father, for our leaders and the leaders of the world that they can resolve the differences that have caused a war and discord. And Father, help us to be thankful for all those things that we have despite the difficulties that we see on the horizon. Most of all, Father, we thank you for forgiveness. And we pray that at this time, we will be found before you with pure hearts ready to worship and serve you this hour. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. certainly appreciate hearing the good prayer that was uttered just now and also to hear the names of those that we do support. It's a marvelous thing that we are in a position to be able to help people like that in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a blessing that, that is for sure. And that takes us to our talk this morning we'd like to, to have regarding the offering that we're about to make in a few minutes. An incident from the life of King David is recorded in, in 1 Chronicles 21 and also in 2 Samuel chapter 24. David makes a decision. He wants to have all the fighting men of Israel numbered. Now, when, this, when he makes his decision to do this, the Bible tells us, in fact, in the passage in, in, uh, in 1 Chronicles, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. You know, folks, when Satan's involved in something, it's never good, Right? So he, he, he uh, incites David to make the census at, at this time. Joab, David's commander-in-chief, objects to this, but David has insisted on it. So Joab and the commanders in the army go out from, da from Beersheba down, down in the south to Dan up in the north to count the number. And they came up with 1,100,000. One, one A lot of soldiers, big army that they had at that time. Well, as a result of him counting like this, is not what God wanted to be done. And so uh, David is confronted by uh, Gad, the, the seer, and he tells David, God is not pleased, with, I'm paraphrasing this, he said, God is not pleased with what you have done. And he's going to give you three choices. The three options are three years of famine, three months of being pursued by your enemies, and David sure didn't want to do that. He'd had a big dose of that early on in his, in his life, so he didn't, didn't, definitely didn't want to do that. The other choice is three days of plague. So David chooses the three days of plague. And in these three days, as the angel of the Lord strikes the, uh, the Israelites, 70,000 of them are, are slain at that time. And then God stayed in the hand of the angel on the threshing, at the threshing floor of Aruna. And then David made a plea to the Lord. This is in First uh, Chronicles chapter 21, verse 17. David said to God, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? 
Lord, my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. And so at this time, God stays the hand of the angel and the, the, the killing of the Israelites, the fighting men of Israel, cease at this time. And what David does at this point, he's going to build an altar. And this is down in verse 18 of First Chronicles 21. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord and the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the Lord that God, Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. And at this time, we find in, uh, in verse 22, David said to him, Let me have the side of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Set it to me at full price. Aruna said to David, Take it. Let my lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. This is remindful of me, at least, when Abraham wanted to bury his, his beloved wife Sarah and wanted to purchase a field in a cave at Machpelah, uh, the, the field in the cave of Machpelah, to bury his, his, his loved one in. And he was offered the cave to, and the land, but he refused to take it. He said, no, I, I, I don't want to uh, do that. I want to pay full price uh, for the cave and for the field. And this is, of course, what he did. So David, David makes a refusal. It says in verse 24, David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on paying the full price. Listen to this, folks. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice of an offering that costs me nothing. We ought to consider sacrifice. I'm reminded of the widow who offered all that she had. David mentioned her a week or so ago. She offered all that she had. And so as we make our contributions to the Lord, it should be something that it costs us something uh, to do so uh, when we make that offering. So as we consider that this morning, as we make our offering, either, either making it online or uh, PayPal, however it may be done, or offering here in the in the in the in the tray. Uh, we won't pass this around, but we'll, you can freely come up and give, give if you like and by, do, by doing that. We want to have a word of prayer this morning on behalf of our, our contribution. Holy Father, we're so glad to be here today, so grateful that you've given us everything as all we have, all the money that we may have, the house we live in, the clothes we wear, the food that we eat, all comes from your awesome hand. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be mindful of helping others as you have helped us. Because when we contribute as we should, and we do give our best to you, that we know that these things are used for preaching people, for, for gospel preaching, for those that, like we were, were mentioning this morning in our prayer. We know it's used for other, other things there as well that's helpful for the cause of the gospel. And we pray, Father, that we would have willing hearts to give. A true heart, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To prepare minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 154. Number 154. Sing all four verses. Try to not keep this up tempo, but not to drag this. <coughs>
Before I begin, we don't pass the communion trays anymore. Um, it's kind of sad, but that's the way it is, I guess. So does everyone have the, em the emblems? If you don't, raise your hand, and we'll make sure that, that you, we get those to you. This past weekend was a holiday that we call Memorial Day. And Memorial Day remembers those who have given their life for this country. Um, it's a more poignant uh, holiday for those who served, but it's a memorial, it's remembrance. And we have another memorial that we're going to observe here in a moment, the memorial of the Lord's Supper. In Matthew 26, I, I won't turn over there and read that, but in Matthew 26, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper by taking the bread and taking the cup and telling his disciples to, to eat and drink of it and to, that, that they would do that with him in the kingdom that was to come. The Hebrews were familiar with memorials. They had a number of them. The Passover was a memorial, a memorial to remember the fact that God brought them, uh, well, passed over them and brought them out of the land of Egypt. The Feast of Booths was uh, a week that they spent living in a tent to remember the time that they uh, dwelled, the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. The one that I'd like to, to look at just real briefly this morning is one that's mentioned in Joshua, the fourth chapter. And Joshua chapter 4, starting at verse 1, it says, Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the people's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this sign let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel together, or forever. So we can imagine... Years down the road, uh, a, a child walking with his dad, and they come to this pile of rocks, and the child says, Daddy, what's this? And if that man was taught by his father, he would say, well, this remembers when we came into the land. And so... They would, they would know, they would remember that time. In fact, in Joshua, if you, if you uh, go on down to verse 9 of chapter 4, it says that then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. So this was a long-lasting memorial. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. But it's a memorial that's very unlike other memorials that we know and may be aware of. Because there's some unique things about it that we ought to remember as we think about what we're doing. First of all, it's set up by the man that's going to be remembered. That doesn't happen. Can you imagine 
Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or any of those who have memorials in Washington saying, set up a memorial for me. Build, a, build this monument to me. No, that doesn't happen. The monument, the memorial is done after the man is dead by other people who think that it's a good idea. And so, first of all, the man who's to be memorialized set it up. And then uh, he says, this is, uh, and, and it's, to, it's to be done for something that has already happened, the second thing. The Vietnam War Memorial um, is, is one that was set up to remember something that happened in the past. But Jesus said it sets this memorial up before it ever happens. He says, eat this bread and drink this cup to remember me. And then the third thing that's unique about it, and then there are probably other things that, that uh, we could find that are unique, is the fact that it's done to remember something that happened, but also something that's going to happen in the future. If we look at 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, when, when the Apostle Paul talks about um, the, the, the memorial, he says that Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But in verse 26, he said, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It not only looks back, but it looks forward. And again, uh, that's something that's unique about this memorial. And so as we get ready to partake of the elements, let's think about these things. Let's, let's realize the significance of what we're about to do. This is something that's far more important than any memorial that you can find in Washington. It commemorates the Lord's death and burial and resurrection and looks forward to his coming again. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread, the representation of the body of your Son, who died on the cross of Calvary for our sins and for the sins of the entire world so that we will not have to face the penalty and pay the penalty for those sins that we commit. Father, we uh, ask that we will examine ourselves as we, as we eat this and that we will look forward to his coming again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us bow our heads again, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the fruit of the vine, the representation of the blood of your son that he shed on the cross of Calvary. We realize the price that he had to pay for us. And we thank you for that. And we pray that our lives might be worthy of his sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the sermon this morning, we'll sing number 37. Number 37, we'll sing all three verses. 
If it's convenient and if you're willing, let's stand while we sing this song. So good to be with you all this morning. What a beautiful day it is, and I'm thankful that the Lord gave us the breath to breathe in this morning to be here. But I'm more thankful for the fact that you made it a priority, that you saw this as something important, and you made yourself available to be here. We thank you so much for your presence, and we invite you to participate with us as we study this morning. Before us is a tried and true verse, and what I mean by that is this is well known. It is one that is almost as famous as John 3.16, for God so loved the world, but almost as misused, misunderstood, and misapplied as well. The Apostle Paul says that love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It's been quoted in movies. It's been put on holiday cards. It's been seen everywhere in many ways. It's common. And what I mean by that is that it's understood by the world. The world knows this verse as well as we do. But it's often misunderstood, often misapplied. And there is a fundamental disconnect between what God says here through the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit and what much of the world believes this to be. And when I say much of the world, I include us in that. I think there are applications here that we miss as well. We can know this to be true just by turning on the television you see it everywhere, opening up the phone. You will see this verse often. We are five days into June, which has been dubbed Pride Month. And you have no choice but to see the promotion and the celebration of the homosexual spectrum on nearly every channel on TV or social media feed, whatever you subscribe to. By the propagation of the rainbow flag on everything. And while this is not a sermon on the sin of homosexuality, per se, it is a glowing example of what I mean by the most misunderstood word and passage, and that is love. 
Paul tells us a couple things here. We know off the bat that love is patient and kind. And then we know verse 7 says that it bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, endures all things. But it tells us of several things that it doesn't do. It doesn't envy. It can't by nature. Love cannot envy. Love does not boast. Love doesn't brag. It can't by nature. It also is not arrogant. The NIV translates that word as proud. It can't be proud. Love can't be rude. It can't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. More importantly, it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. But it rejoices in the truth. By this explanation, what is known as Pride Month and celebrating the spectrum of the LGBTQ community. Will they love to tout that love is love? Love cannot be proud. And so we see that there is a fundamental disconnect in our understanding of this word. And even what we might understand it to be versus what the world does. And even though we have other descriptors here, there is a gap in the understanding. And our job as Christians is supposed to be to help bridge that gap. To help them find their way back to the source of it all and to truly know who and what love is. And so this morning we're going to spend a little time talking about this concept. This is something that Christians, we ought to know. And yet we often misunderstand exactly what this means. Too often, especially in regards to the LGBTQ movement, we come across as harsh and unloving and thereby damaging our opportunity to help them understand where it is that they are misunderstanding. And as Christians, we have a unique opportunity to not just stand in judgment with fingers pointed saying that you're wrong about this, but we also have the opportunity to say, but you're loved. And too often, we don't. We just say that you're wrong. Where's the love in that? Where's the patience? Where's the kindness? Where's the bearing of all things? Do we not believe the whole scripture or just the parts that we like? What I hope to do over the next few minutes is to help us all understand a little better what it is that we are and who it is that we are and to know and express our words and actions while maintaining the truth of the scriptures. You see, the need to be loved is a fundamental human need that every human being senses, in fact, needs it. And you think as much as people sense the need of being loved and talk about being in love, that would be an easy definition of what love is. But apparently, there's not. And it's because human beings make love complicated. Sometime back, there was a book written based upon an extensive study of the topic of love, and it was written for the <clears throat> psychiatry and psychology uh, fields of science. And the authors wrote in it, quote, it says, in spite of a few remarkable contributions, we can definitely state that love has not been the object of much psychological or psychiatric research. Most of what we know about it comes from either limited private experiences or from the insights of poets, novelists, playwrights, and artists. They go on to state that with rare exceptions in the indexes of the most psychoanalytic, psychiatric, and psychological books and textbooks, we do not find an entry for the word love at all. And even such important cultural media as the Encyclopedia Britannica, there are no articles about the subject. You won't find one. Why not? Why would love be so hard to define? And I believe it is because the psychiatric world wasn't looking at love as an objective reality that could be measured. It was looking at love and seeing an emotional response only. 
It was seeing it as a subjective experience that came in different ways to different people. And I suspect since they couldn't measure love empirically, there's no container that you can put it in to say, well, this is it. They found it to be hard study and even harder to explain scientifically. And yet God believes that love can be understood, that, God, that love can be quantified and measured because God may love the law of his kingdom. James wrote, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and you do well. John wrote this. John said, this is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. In 1 John 3, verse 11. In Romans 13, Paul says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And I think that's worthy of remembering. Maybe you want to write that down. That he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. I want you to understand the context of that passage that it's commanded. How do you command a feeling if the feeling is not first a choice? Feelings can't be commanded. Feelings are byproducts of the choices that we make. It's not something that can be commanded if it's only a feeling, if it's only in the emotional response. But notice what Jesus said. He said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. There is a choice Jesus is giving here. Stay here in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. That's how we do it. Just as I have obeyed the Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You ever find that your joy is lacking? You ever find that you don't have any at all? This might be a good place to go back to. Jesus wanted his joy to be in you and that our joy would be complete. Another word for the word complete there is perfect. And my command is this, again, with the command. Love each other as I've loved you. God commands us to love. God believes love is definable, and God believes love is measurable, and that it can be understood, and it can be obeyed, and so it's not as complicated as we like to make it. But if God believes this, why would worldly disciplines like psychology and psych psych psychiatry have such a difficult time explaining it then? Why are there no entries in their books for it? Why is it only in the Bible that we find the quantifiable, measurable, definable love? I think there's a couple of reasons. But I think, first of all, that they don't think about love the way that God does. To them, love is a feeling that you get when you look at someone. A physical attraction for a person or an animal or an object. And indeed, a couple years ago, scientists showed several people pictures of their loved ones while charting their brain waves as an experiment. They did this with an MRI machine, and they discovered four different parts of the brain literally lit up on the screen, when these people saw these pictures of their loved ones. But again, they're just studying the effects of the emotion of love. God has an entirely different concept here. To God, love is not so much something that happens to us. It's not just something that we experience. Love is something that we do. It is something that we engage in. It is a decision, a choice to be made. When husbands and wives make their vows on their wedding day to one another, they vow to love one another. And as you'll figure out, 
as you go through the years. Sometimes that is a choice you have to make every day. While that doesn't sound very romantic, and that doesn't sound like the love that we've learned from the movie screen, the truth is, it is a decision to love your spouse every day of your life. And there will be times and days where you don't feel like it. But there again, it's not about your feelings. It is about the commitment and the choice that you made to love this person till death do you part. And so understanding that love isn't something that we do. God put this on full display. This is how we know what love is. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he felt a certain way about us. No, he gave. He gave. When God loved us, he got involved with us. He did something. He didn't talk about love. He did love. And that is what he asked of us. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. This is it. This is how God said you can know what love is. That it is completely sacrificial. There is nothing for you in loving someone else. And too often, especially in our current day and age, we think love is about us. It's about what you do for me. It's about how you make me feel. When in reality, Jesus says, it is about everyone else. You see, love isn't love until you've given it away. It's not something that you take. Again, love is not selfish. Love is selfless. Love is sacrificial. It doesn't insist on my way. This is where I think Christians get it wrong. This is where I think we struggle the most because we absolutely want it our way. And anything less in our eyes is sinful. And brethren, we are wrong when we take that attitude because we're not living out the definition that God gives us. God commands love. He's not commanding an emotion. He's not commanding in a feeling. He's not commanding us to have a feeling towards one another. He is commanding action. And the reason I believe psychiatry and psychology have been trouble, they've, they've, they've had trouble defining what this is, so they're trying to understand what people naturally do and contrary to the sentiments expressed so often when we say, I love you, love is not simply passion, affection, and close ties. It's not friendship merely. Love is more accurately described by words like unconditional and sacrificial. That it is something I give. They take us beyond a view of love that's easy and natural. True love causes pain, and by nature, we back away from pain. True love requires sacrifice, and by nature, we avoid sacrifice. Love demands unconditional commitment, and by nature, we fear committing ourselves so completely and utterly. You see, love exposes our fragile natures. If you truly truly want to love someone, you have to make yourself completely vulnerable. Because another word for love is trust. And until I've 
broken down all the barriers. And I've torn down my walls and left myself open for injury. Then I'm not truly loved. I've simply said it. But I haven't done it. Love exposes our fragile natures. You see, love isn't complicated. We are. We're complicated. And so God sends help. Look at Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And of course, it's joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Also, other descriptors in the definition of love from 1 Corinthians 13. But love is the first flavor of this nine-flavored fruit. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It is the fruit. It is one fruit. And its paramount ingredient is love. Because again, we back away from pain. We back away from sacrifice. We back away from commitment. We back away from exposing ourselves to vulnerability. And so God sends help by way of the Spirit. In other words, love is the fruit of God's Spirit within me. It isn't something that we do naturally. It is the result of God's Spirit working with my heart in mind. The Apostle John said it this way. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from, not within, from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Love is not something that we naturally do. You know how I know. Children are born as blank slates. They're a an open canvas to be filled with what we teach them. And on many sad occasions, I've met children who were absolutely deprived of love. And you see that in their actions. You see that in their behaviors. You see that in the fact that they don't know what to do when you express love to them, and it makes them uncomfortable. When our babies are born... They're a blank canvas. They don't love us. Not yet. Katie, there's no doubt that Palmer is going to love you because of the love that you and Carter show her. There's no doubt that my grandbaby that's coming is going to love her grumpy or his grumpy because I'm going to spoil that kid rotten. We teach love. We show love. And when it's learned, it's then reciprocated. But that tells me that God's kind of love doesn't generally come naturally to you and me. Love in its purest form comes from God because God is love. By definition. And without godly love in our lives, our own concept of love will pale in comparison to his. It'll be just merely an echo. And so if true love doesn't naturally come to us, what does? Well, I'm not going to read the entire passage. But Colossians 3 verses 1 through 10 tell us what is really natural for men and women. But in verses 8 through 10... It says, you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, the natural man, the natural self, the things that come natural to us, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. There's a whole litany of sinful behaviors here like anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language. And it says, you used to walk in these in the way that you once lived. But the Bible teaches us that even the nicest person has a selfish streak just below the surface, that each one of us have been guilty at some point of anger or wrath or malice. 
slander or obscene talk or lying or, or any of these things with the old self and the old practices because those are the things that come natural. Those are the things that come easy to us. Love is easy to understand, but it's difficult to do. And the Bible tells us that unless the Spirit of God guides us in our lives, unless he continually teaches us to love one another, we will revert to our old, selfish, self-centered selves. I like to think of myself as a pretty easygoing, nice guy. I'm easy to get along with, I think. I generally will give you the shirt off my back, but I will not give you the food off my plate. Y'all think I'm kidding. Kelly and I were on one of our first dates. <clears throat> We'd gone to this wing place in Jonesboro, Georgia that we used to love to go to. And we had both eaten our wings, and I still had fries on my plate, and she reached over to my plate. And I looked at her like, what is this? And she was all laughing and play. I wasn't laughing. I was like, what are you doing? Those are my fries. There's a couple of things you don't mess with in the world. You don't mess with a man's woman. You don't mess with a man's money. You don't mess with his fries. And I say that jokingly. I've had to learn how to share. I've learned that, that, that Kelly will order what she's going to order every time we go somewhere. And that I've, if I'm going to get something new... That's how she's going to try it. She's going to eat it off my plate. I've just had to learn how to share. But in a very silly way, isn't that love? Learning how to be selfless. And it's because just beneath the surface, I'm just as selfish as anybody else. God says that we're all selfish just beneath the surface. And so the Bible repeatedly tells us again and again to love one another because it's not easy. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. But God doesn't just tell us how to love one another. He gives us his spirit to help us learn how to love this way. He gives us the Bible that we can read and study and devote ourselves Time every day to better understand what it means to love one another. Galatians 5.22 tells us that part of the fruit of the Spirit is having God's love within us. And the inverse of that is true, that having love is having God's Spirit within us. And so when you and I became Christians, we were formed then into a contract or a covenant with God. And when you see a married man or woman, you'll often see a wedding ring. On their fingers. And it's usually a beautiful ring and one of significant purpose. It marks the person who wears it as belonging to someone else. The job of the Spirit is to signify that we belong to someone else. And the Spirit's job then is occasionally to make us uncomfortable and to remember to remind me and you if we're not reflecting God's love in our lives. Paul tells us then in Galatians 5, 16, just before verse 22, to walk in the Spirit. It means we have to consciously spend time in God's presence. We need to continually walk in his spirit. That means spending time in prayer. That means spending time in Bible study. Spending time here worshiping with your brethren. It means spending so much time with God that you and I learn how he learns. Or how he thinks. We learn what pleases him and what, what we spend so much time with him that we, we begin to start copying him and how we treat others. We begin to think like him and act like him. We begin to love like him. When we walk close to God, we deliberately seek to walk in his spirit. Then we can learn truly what love is and what it means to love. The love of God is different than the world's love because God's love is something that you give, not something you receive. It's humble. It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't boast and it's most definitely not proud. 
but it does bear all things. It does believe all things, and it hopes all things. And this is what we have to help those who do not understand, understand. Jesus says, by your love for one another, they will know that you are mine. So, in closing, I'll say this. Love is when we learn to focus less on getting love and focus more on giving it. Because that's the way that God loves us. Again, John 3.16 is used so often to define what love is. And that is that it works, it does, it engages. And so when you love someone, you naturally move toward them. I'll never forget whenever Cole was little, he asked me one time, he says, Daddy, is mom your mom? I said, no, why? Because you always want to sit by her. You always want to hold her hand. At five years old, my son understood what love was in a very simple way. I love my wife, and so I move towards her. And he recognized that because he loves his mom. He also moves toward her. It's a very simple example, but it makes all the difference. God so loved that he moved toward us. So loved as, as in a volume that could be measured unlike any scientist that has ever tried to measure it. And so God and his leaning in meets us here where we are. Because he so loved us. He leaned right here into the middle of our junk. Whatever your junk is, God leaned right into the middle of it. And he sends Christ to be the righteousness that we would need. Because none are righteous, right? And our righteousness is never going to be enough to cancel the record of the debt for our sin. And our best day is never going to be enough. Listen to me. We are never going to be good enough to save ourselves. Look at me. We are never going to be good enough to save ourselves, ever. And so what we have in this text, in John 3, 16, is that God so loved the world that he moves toward us. He initiates his love. He moved first. And then God's moving towards me, publicly acknowledges that Keith Stoneheart is going to need a Savior. Because I'm going to fall short. And I'm going to be far from perfect. And God said, he's going to need me. And so I'm making the first move. Because I still struggle sometimes with the fact that God loves me at all. And the fact that he loves me right now, not some future version of me when I'm better. He loves the mess that I am right now. And that if God's love moves towards all of us, what are we waiting on not to move towards him? How do we respond? It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. We are. And so I'll leave that here for you to think about. To consider your life. To consider what it means to love and to be loved. To better define who we are by better defining who he is, that God is love, and that we are his when we reciprocate the love. 1 John 4, 17 says that when love is perfected, we're his. There's no fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And so if you're scared this morning, if you're in fear, of what's to come in the next life. God said, you don't have to be. And so I don't know your situation. But while we sing the song, I'll beg you to consider what that means in your life. And if you need to act upon it, if you need to move towards God and his love, he's already moved towards you. I'll beg you to respond as we encourage you.
Let us bow. Dear Lord, we pray that our service today is being out of our love for you and love for each other. It has been pleasing in your sight that we've all gained much from it and that we've learned something from it. We ask that this time that you be with those who are sick of a number, be with the hands that are caring for them, also be with their families that they are attending to them to give them strength that they need to see after their loved ones. We pray that you will help those who are recovering from recent surgeries, continue to recover, to get back to their much-wanted place and health and life. We pray for Tino's grandchild that may soon be delivered. Pray that everything will go well with them. We ask you to be as congregation here at Fultondale, that we will grow in strength and number, love for each other, and love for our fellow man. We also pray that you will be with our congregations throughout the world, but especially ones like the one Brother Reese mentioned this afternoon, South America, all over Europe, the places where they're worshiping in adverse and harsh conditions and oppression from the government or people. We pray that you will give them strength and courage to carry on. Dear Lord, as we've been taught by Keith this morning, if we have our love for you and love for our fellow man, the evil in this world will go away. And we pray that there will be a light shown in people's hearts and their minds, that they will see that you are a God, and that you have a love for us. And as your son taught us the greatest commandments to love you first and love our fellow man and the evils and things we've seen here recently be done away with. People teach love in their home and respect for life that this evil will go away. We ask now that you forgive us for our sins. We thank you so much for the blessings of life that you bless us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It certainly is good to be with you all this morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. We have a large number of visitors today, and we are really blessed by your presence, and we appreciate you being here. I invite you back anytime you can. It's always nice having visitors. I want to thank the men this morning for leading us in our worship service, for the prayers that were offered up for us, and the words that help prepare our minds to serve God. And thank you, Keith, for that lesson. Good lesson. We have a lot on our list to be prayerful about. Uh, we have several announcements, and, and if I overlook anyone, let me know, and we'll make, make that known. It's good to see uh, Mag and Robert Miller. We don't get to see them very often. It's good to see them out. Terry and, and Delois, it's good to see y'all continue to recover as well. Uh, others, we have, and, and Miss Bobby Belzer, we've had her in our prayers. She's, she's looking really well today, and good to see her with us. We have a lot out of town this morning, uh, a lot of families, the Harpers, the Jaspers. Uh, I know Brian and Angie probably will be out of town. Uh, we want to remember Angie's, especially right now, her father's not doing well. Uh, he has cancer, as we know, and is in the last stages of that. So let's remember Angie and her travels and, and the uh, anguish and pain that she has to go through dealing with, with the loss of her father. Her, her, Father's help. Uh, Tino and Vicki are out of town as well this morning. They're in Mobile. Uh, Tino informed me that Vicki wasn't feeling well this morning, but they both tested negative for the COVID virus, so that's good news. Carlina will be admitted this evening at 6 o'clock is the schedule and uh, induced for her delivery, and, and we pray that that goes well as, as also. And uh, we have several on the sick list. Peyton Kennedy is at home this morning. Uh, he's tested positive for the virus. Kalen as well. Um, Joan McCarty was not feeling well this morning and not able to get out. And I know m most of you remember Olita Thomas, who worshiped here for many years. She is dealing with some dizziness, and, and they're not sure why yet, so uh, the doctors are are still working on that. So we let's pray for Alita that they can find the uh, cause and, and get treatment for that as well. Uh, and I know the Jaspers are out of town, but they've also been dealing with some of the sickness too. So let's keep them in our prayers. And it's good to see the Burns family back as well. Uh, that's all the announcements I have this morning. But I haven't overlooked anything else. Keith, yes. Morning traveling to... Uh... Okay. Uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be down on the set up for a couple of days. We'll be home Sunday. 
Okay, so Keith and uh, I guess all three of you, the Stonehearts will be in Florida, so let's keep them in our prayers of how safe travels. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, I have a card that I'm going to attempt to read to you. Uh, I will put this in the back once, once I'm finished. And uh, so let's keep this in our mind. It's from the Wilshire family. It says, Dearest brothers and sisters in Christ, it is with humble and thankful hearts that our family would like to thank each and every one of you for all of your love and care during Steve's illness and then his passing, for all the visits, the calls, the many cards and the food, but especially the many prayers that we know you prayed for Steve and for us. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Steve loved all of you so much, so dearly, as do we. Please continue to pray for us as we strive to join him in glory. We believe that Steve can now say, as Paul wrote in Timothy, in 2 Timothy 6, 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. All of our love, Marcia, Mandy, Lexi, and all of the Wilshire family. Uh, we know how much Steve meant to the church here at Fultondale and how much we mean to him and meant to him. And he is dearly missed. We know that. And we do pray for his family. We pray for the work to continue here and the legacy he left behind. That's all I have this morning. Uh, please join us again at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you.